OK, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sadina Gamma. I'm the chief pharmacist for the borough of Merton. Um, I've worked in Merton for the last 20 years and um, I currently work um, in both the vaccination clinics in Merton and um, supporting the clinicians and patients with any queries that they have. Um, I also manage a group of uh, pharmacists and a technician that work in the care homes, so you will know some of them. So I have um, a lot of experience with working with um, all staff, um, healthcare and social care staff in Merton, and uh, it's quite a pleasure to be here to help um, allay some of your anxieties, um, bust any myths that you have, and help you make a uh, right decision around vaccination. Thank you. Thank Basa. you. Hi, uh, hi. I'm Basa. I'm a GP in Sutton and Merton Borders, um, and I've been involved with Sedina for, for too many years to quantify them. Uh, and, I regret, and I'm really happy that Nisha is also joining us today. I've been on, I've been with Nisha on many webinars on this topic. So we are here to answer all the questions. And I always say every question, we'll try and give you an answer. Every concern, there is a reason behind it, and we want to deal with it. So don't feel shy. Don't feel bad. Just, just ask the question. We are here to answer it. Thank you, Vasa. That's great. And I'll just add, we do have Debbie Calver here on the line because this is we do normally have an infection prevention control slot, but because the Q and A may take longer, Debbie will be answering the questions in the in the chat, um, and she's here on the call as well. So thank you, Vasa and Sadina, and and to Deborah as well for supporting us. Um, so we'd set this session as. Um, one, because we had a lot of questions and, and, and hesitancy from staff um, because of um, things about the, the, the race, religion, ethnic background or cultural background. Um, so we've set that as a bit of a theme, but there may be broader questions as well, which Vasa and Sidi will be happy to ask. But just to, um, to start us off, I think, along that theme, some of the questions that came in advance that I'll put to you just to get us started is, um, so many of the staff, uh, one of the care home managers reported, many of my staff from BME background are very nervous about receiving the vaccine, what advice can I give them? And are there no, any known side effects for BME people in taking either of the vaccines? Thank you, Vicky. I, I'll get going and I know Celita can join me. So one of the best things about the NHS is that the NHS is a very high employer of people from uh, black and minority ethnic backgrounds. So when the vaccine first rolled out, uh, in, in hospitals where we first began. Uh, we, we have over the last more, more than a month now have experience of all our NHS staff, regardless of ethnicity or race, running down to take their place at the vaccine point in the hospital. And the good news is now four weeks later, we don't have any reports coming out of hospitals saying that the impact of the vaccine by its side effects was felt greater among those doctors, nurses, therapists, pharmacists of minority ethnic origin who were immunized from December onwards in our hospital. I, and I think that is important to remember because we can always talk, go back to papers and that paper said this and this paper said this, but I look at real effect in hospitals and I am reassured by that because as, as you know, I have lots of friends and colleagues uh, who are from minority ethnic communities who are doctors. Selina has got lots of friends and colleagues from minority ethnic communities who, who are pharmacists. So does Nisha. And you know what, Nisha, Selina and I, you know, we come from minority ethnic communities ourselves. So we've got friends and families in our social life. But we, we don't, we are not clinicians uh, 24 hours a day. We are only clinicians during the daytime. But the evenings and Saturdays, we are people from ethnic communities ourselves. So we talk to our communities. And in our, within our friends and family members too, who are who have been immunized, we are not hearing anything about it adversely affecting. What, what we know, the truth, is that looking at what the catastrophic loss of life in April, May, and equally catastrophic loss of life in January, we know from uh, our patients. So I was speaking to my patient the other day, um, and we, were, we are hearing true stories about two family members in, two, in ITUs from families, from minority ethnic communities. So to me, the, the evidence is not that the minority communities should fear the vaccine, they should fear the disease. Uh, I totally agree with you, Vasa. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I work in the two clinics in Merton. We have immunized lots and lots of people from a BAME background, staff, patients, and we're not aware that any 
um, particular person of BME background has had any worse side effects um, than anybody else. Um, the side effects are mild, they are transient, a bit of soreness of your arm. Yeah, I mean, as I say to people, when you have the vaccine and you experience the fever or the headache or the temperature or, or the aches, it's because your body's working with that vaccine. It started to do its its job. Um, and, and we're not aware that any um, communities are experiencing those side effects any more than other communities. Likewise, we haven't noticed any difference between the vaccine. So both are effective, both are safe. And, and, you know, in making the decision, it's really about going to have a vaccine and not to worry about any particular side effects with either of the vaccine or because you're from a particular background. And Selina, just for the record, when I was told there's a space for me at the vaccine site, I said, can you give me 40 minutes to get there? That's the only thing I asked them. No other questions. I was there in 30 minutes. He was. I was there when Vasa had his jab and um, he, he <laughs> sat, he took it in. It was over before he knew it. And yes, he just went back to doing his, his daily chores. So, yeah, <laughs> we've all had it and there's been no problem whatsoever. Thank you. And I think there's that leads us on to another question, because some of some of, uh, one of the managers was saying that some of the staff claim to have had very bad side effects from the vaccine and have had to take some time off after it. Um, whereas other care home managers are saying that none of their staff have had any problems. But how could managers reassure um, other staff when they sort of hear that some people are, are, are have bad side effects? So the truth, the, so the truth is that it is true that most people I ever come across have achy arm, little bit of fever, little bit of body ache. Most people are telling me it lasts 24, 48 hours. Some people say three days, but. The, the statistics also tell us that these statistics can last, these side effects can last up to a week. So I say to people, the majority are not suffering for a week, the majority are aching and paining a little bit for a day or two, but managers need to be aware that if their staff are feeling unwell, okay, worst case scenario, it may take them a week. But it's not all staff, it is some staff. But unfortunately for us, we can't predict which person will get better in a day or two and which person may be off for a week. But I always say it's far better to be offered a week with a vaccine rather than to be asked for weeks and weeks with the disease. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree with Vasa. I think the thing to remember is that when you're immunized, it is about what your body does next with the vaccine. We are all different. So that means that we will all have slightly different um, reaction to, to the vaccine. But those are good reactions because it means that our body is doing what it's supposed to do when it's immunized. And it just means that, yes, some people will have very transient, um, uh, mild symptoms, but they're nothing like having COVID. And, and, and I certainly have had many relatives who have sadly passed away from COVID or had COVID. My own daughter's had COVID. I know what it's like to, you know, for someone to have COVID. And I can assure you that you will not have anything like that when you have the vaccine. So it, it is, you know, weighing up that benefit and that risk. You, you know, it, it's 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 really you might never have the side effects from the vaccine, but you almost certainly will suffer from COVID. Thank you, Sadina and Vasa. And I think there's a specific question someone had. You may have already answered this, but if there's anything you wanted to add, um, that the person who said there's nobody has just be a bit of background noise thank you when i have so this person said when i have the flu vaccine i get sick and i'm bedridden when normally i'm healthy all year round so why should i take the covid vaccine so i would say you you need to discuss this with your gp but if you were my if i was your gp so i'll run this as if i was your gp but really need to talk about the gp because your gp knows exactly what your other issues are. It may be that you have other medical conditions. I don't want to ask in open arena. It may be that you your body is sensitive, therefore you your body behaves differently. So when we give a vaccine, we are provoking an antibody response from the body to start getting the soldiers warmed up, ready for the fight. Mm -hmm. So during that process, clearly your body is getting more fatigued than most of my other patients. The question you got asked then is, if your body normally responds with one week of illness after a flu vaccine, how is your body going to respond if your body meets COVID-19 virus itself? So if the vaccine makes you unwell for a week, we can, we can predict from that that 
if you meet COVID-19, it's not going to be a week of uh, post-vaccine fatigue. It's going to be much longer than that. So you've got to balance the risk of chancing COVID-19 vaccine in its full form or meeting the, um, the, the virus in its full form. So if you compare the two, vaccine versus virus, the vaccine is definitely going to have a milder impact on your body than the virus. The virus will have a greater impact. Vaccine will have a lesser impact. And you've got to balance that risk and decide for yourself, do I want to chance the virus, which we know what it can do, or do I want to take the vaccine knowing in most people the side effects last for a week? Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Vasa. So that helps to hopefully helps um, with that individual. And I can see a few questions that came in advance and coming in the chat and, and questions about the um, development of the vaccine. So things around how has the vaccine been rolled out so quickly compared to other vaccines that take years of trials? And when it was developed, have they tested it, um, trialled it on people of BME background and people with um, sickle cell and lupus, so, so traits that black people may have, were they covered in the trials? Good. So the, the answer is yes. Normally, vaccine development takes far too long. This time around, because we were in such difficult times, the, the, the government said to the industry, we'll fund it, we'll purchase it, you just go and make it. That's the first thing. The second thing is there was international collaboration between countries and between manufacturers. The third thing is normally it takes a long time to recruit people to come on trials. But this time I had medical colleagues uh, queuing up to join the trial from minority ethnic communities because you know what? In April, these colleagues of mine had seen enough. So they were willing, really, they were the guys who were the brave guys who went into these trials. Uh, clinicians from every single hospital and primary care too joined these trials from various ethnic backgrounds. So it was, so it was a compression of the usual time scale. It was fully funded, people cooperated, people enlisted into the trials in great numbers across the board. And because of that, the process wasn't rushed, but the process could be speeded up. And, and, and no shortcuts were taken because MHRA doesn't take any shortcuts. It looked at all the evidence when it was provided. And that is why, you know, they, they give the license one by one. They don't give a collective license to all the, all the products. We, we, one, then the other. That's how MHRA works. So I would say, yes, it was fast, but I wouldn't say it was rushed. And I think there's a subtle difference in that because the diligence was followed because Britain doesn't take kindly or take this lightly. It, it, the, the way MHRA works is it's a scientific organization. It is not a political organization. It doesn't it doesn't do what politicians want to do. It does what it has to do. Serena, do you want to come on that? Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely true. I think there's something else that people need to realize, and that is in the development of this vaccine, we went starting from scratch. The technology had been used for other vaccines like the Ebola vaccine. So, so there was a lot of knowledge. There was at least two years worth of knowledge on how the, the, um, the, the way the vaccine was going to be manufactured. The other thing to remember is that there was a huge level of collaboration. Now, normally a company is developing a product, be it a medicine or a vaccine, they're developing it on their own in pure isolation. It's, it's quite competitive in that sense. Whereas when it came to this vaccine, there was a lot of collaboration across the world, clinicians, trialists, companies, because everybody wanted to, to get to the point where we could have a vaccine. So that's a major difference between the trials that were done for this vaccine and the trials that are normally done for other products. Um, the other thing to realize is that the recruitment, as Vasa said, was quite quick. People were willing and they stepped up. So, you know, you know, each vaccine has over 40,000 people in the trial. Um, I was watching something where a clinician was talking about clinical trials. And one thing he said was, you know, a lot of trials have about 5,000 patients, you know, and that is over a long period of time. It takes that long to get that number of patients. Whereas with this trial, people step forward because, as Vasa also said, we'd all seen enough. The death rates were high. We needed to do something. Thing. And yes, I have lots of colleagues that step forward very willingly to be in the trial, many from BAME background. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I think that there was a question about was it starting from scratch with this, but actually it wasn't starting from scratch is what you've explained, isn't it? They're built on, on, on research that they had already done. Um, there's a really lovely, some people, someone's put in their uh, links from, uh, so thank you, Sayama. Apologies if I'm Sayama, mispronouncing. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, so so um, links from Muslim organisations explaining in detail about the vaccines being safe and permissible. So that might be a helpful resource um, for some of the managers and staff on here as well to look at. One of the, a couple of other questions that we've had coming in um, are about the um, the vaccine. So people saying that is it is it true that all the current vaccines are intended not to prevent transmission of the virus, but to prevent the development of severe symptoms of COVID-19? Do they prevent transmission at all? And along those same lines, someone saying, well, if it doesn't provide immunity and it won't stop me from getting COVID or even dying from it, I still have to follow all the government guidelines and wear PPE and the mask and socially distance, still can't see my friends and family. So what, why should we actually get the vaccine? So so let's go to the point. I think we, we none of us should ever forget. It's a bit like none of us ever forget Dunkirk. None of us ever forget the Battle of Britain. Why? Because they were two cardinal moments in the history of Britain. Our survival depended on Dunkirk and our survival depended on Battle of Britain. Similarly, when I retire, I've done nearly 30 years of medical life now. When I retire, I'll tell you now, I will only remember, sadly, April 2020, and January 2021. I remember only two months of my 30 years of clinical practice because those two months, I signed away too many death certificates. I received too many notifications of patients who were very close to me passing away. So the question for me is, my entire 30 years of clinical practice is now reduced to merely two months because those were the most momentous two months of my practice of medicine. So the reason I say that to you is that, the reason I say that is that because of the loss of life in those two months in my life. The purpose of the vaccine is to reduce death, to reduce people needing to go to ITU, is to reduce people who need oxygen. Because you know what, COVID is not death. COVID is death plus survival with damage. So the whole idea of the vaccine is to prevent maximum amount of damage for the survivors, and for the death for those who sadly departed. So the two reasons we talk about the vaccine is not to prevent mild disease. It's about severe disease and death. Going to the thing about spreading, the spreading question, if you let me answer socially, and then we'll come to the science of it. Socially, look at it this way. If I get severe disease, and it can prevent me getting severe disease, let's look at the two scenarios. If I get severe disease, first, I'll give it to my wife who will look after me for a few days before I go into hospital. I have a risk of giving it to the paramedic who takes me to hospital. I'll have a risk of giving my disease to the porter, the cleaner, the doctor, the nurse, the therapist who will look after me. And sadly, if I die, I can also kindly, unkindly, give it to the poor mortician who look after, looks after me when I'm dead and gone. So I can spread the virus if I get severe disease. If I take the vaccine and I don't get severe disease, all the above mentioned people, I have not given it to them. Therefore, yes, in people who get severe disease and transmit the disease to others, the virus does prevent transmission. But the, what the virus doesn't do is that it is not designed to prevent transmission in people who get mild disease or more. But the issue here is that we didn't set about to reduce transmission. We set about to reduce death and destruction. But evidence is now coming that it also works. In the scientific world, I'll leave that for Selena. In the scientific world, the evidence is now coming that it does indeed reduce transmission. But let's step back and look at the big picture. The big picture was not reduction of transmission. The big picture was those two months, which I will never forget. Selena, do you want to come on that, please? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The, the, the thing about viruses is, as we know, they're easily spread. Um, there are many patients who contract COVID and can't for the life of them think of how they got it. So, so viruses are sneaky little things. They e very easily spread. It's important, and, and we will we will have viral disease. We all have viral disease. We have colds, we have coughs, and, and a lot of them are caused by viruses. But this particular virus has a very detrimental effect. And the whole point of being vaccinated is that when we do contract the virus, that it will be mild, that it, we will not have severe disease, we will not have long COVID afterwards, and we will not definitely end up on ITU. So, so that, that is the objective, is, is reducing the severe end of viral disease. 
as we know, there are many people who, who are asymptomatic and are carrying the virus. But if that virus then is spread to somebody who has underlying conditions or whose body it, it succumbs to the virus, it, it is dangerous. So yes, after you've been immunized, you still have to wear your mask and wash your hands and socially distance. But with time, the evidence is emerging on what these vaccines can do. The vaccines are being improved all the time. So we know that we need to protect against the dominant variant of the vaccine now. But obviously with time, we may need to be having something slightly different. Um, it, it's, it's, it, this is going to be something that we, we need to do and we need to do everything we can do to prevent the death. So the vaccine is one of the, the things in our defence. Social distancing, mask washing hands is also part of the armoury that we've got against this virus. Thank you, Sadina and Vasa. And a few questions coming in around um, that uh, some people who'd had the first dose, some people who'd even had the second dose, and then they have um, contracted the virus. Um, and so what is the kind of e efficacy? You know, how, how much protection does it give you if you've had one dose or if you've had two dose? And how do they... Um, Kind of as a little bit of it that, that, and you probably answered some of this, but you know, why, why should they yeah. still get the vaccine if yeah. they're still potentially going sure. to? So let, let's begin uh, uh, as usual. Serena, is, Serena kindly always comes back after I have set, set the scene. So I'll carry on in that theme. And don't forget Nisha out there. She can also contribute. So <laughs> the, the issue about I got the vaccine, I got the disease. I think it's best explained by understanding the lag period, I call it. So yeah. there's something called the incubation period, which means that you have someone has given you the bug but it is in you and you don't know it's in you you haven't yet developed the disease but it is working in you now the incubation period it's a bit like the cake in the oven you know it, it, it takes i don't know i don't bake a cake but i know it, it's there in the oven for an hour or two and i'm told just leave it alone don't touch it right so in that period of five to seven days for most people but can be up to 14 days for others you already have it but you don't know it you also need to understand that when they give you the vaccine, it doesn't work on you straight away to protect you. So if I buy a life insurance policy, the moment I buy it, it is, it is there. It protects, well, it doesn't protect me from dying, but it pays out. It pays out the moment I sign the papers for life insurance policy. Unfortunately, the, the immunization doesn't work like that. The immunization, again, takes about 14 days, more 21 days to have the full powerful effect of the immunization. So when you combine the lag period of the immunization for the injection to work and the vaccine to manifest, in that time, there are people, unfortunately, who have become COVID positive despite being immunized. That is not a vaccine failure. That is the sad fact of the vaccine having a lag to become effective and the incubation period for the virus. That's how I explain it to my patients when they ask me this question. It's a very commonly asked question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you, you've explained it quite well. People need to understand the lag time between when you have the vaccine and, and, and it being fully effective, which is why you still need to do all the right things even after you've had the vaccine. Very important. And is there any kind of uh, figures you can give around sort of the level of protection they offer after one dose or after and after two doses? I, mean, I, think, I think for both vaccines, you're looking at a level of about 50% upwards after the first dose, and then for the second dose, anything from 70% upwards. But we also have to remember that even with the vaccines that we have to, to date, there's not 100% um, um, sort of guarantees. It's not it's not 100% uh, immunity that you develop. Um, there are always going to be variants of the, the, the viruses. And so, which is why it's important that we take these vaccines because with each vaccine that we take, it's the fight, we, we're intensifying the fight against the virus. Thank you, Sadina. And I'm just going to say, Dudley, thank you very much for joining us today. But do you mind turning your video off just because we record it? It will record you on there. Thank you, Dudley. Um, so there Vicky, is also quite a few. Yes. Vicky, there's a question uh, which I'd like to cover sure. uh, about, about people with lupus. or I would like to cover any other disease. I think it's very yes. important from minority ethnic communities because we know that certain diseases affect minority communities more. So the issue there is that so far, all the consultants who look, look after my patients, whether it is multiple sclerosis or motor neuron disease or Parkinson's or lupus or transplant patients or dialysis patients or heart failure patients or you name it, 
So far, none of those consultants are telling me, please don't immunize my, my person. What I'm hearing is the contrary. They are, they are telling me on, on the times I meet them um, at meetings, when are you going to get to my man, they ask me. When are you going to get Mrs. So-and-so, whom they know we look after together. So the drive from all these consultants is immunize these people who have got comorbidity because we know that, that these people are vulnerable because we give them sometimes immunosuppressive drugs which means that the, the, their body's uh, ability to fight is diminished. So we, we have been immunizing. I have seen people come into the vaccine center. I know from their face that they are on steroids, which are immunosuppressive drugs for transplant or other diseases. I don't ask them because I'm not there as a GP, I'm there as a vaccinator. But I know, I know that, that there they are people who have been immunocompromised. And we do vaccinate people who are on immunosuppressive medication, absolutely. But we do tell them that they may not make as much as a strong antibody response as someone who is not immunosuppressed, but that's the way the way the system is. But definitely, we don't tell them go away because you are on immunosuppressive medication. They they need to be immunized, and they are being immunized. Yeah, no, absolutely. We we do immunize um, um, patients, and and um, my colleagues at the Royal Marsden are immunizing their cancer patients as well. Um, I see that somebody's asked which vaccine is suitable for a kidney transplant person. Either of them is, you know, the, the key thing is to have have a vaccine. Um, both of them will protect you just as much as each other. Thank you. There's quite a few questions that have come in in the chat, but also in advance around the, the change, because um, the originally the second dose was meant to be three weeks after um, and now it's been pushed back 12 weeks. So people concerned about I mean, one, why did that happen? But also, is it still going to be as, as effective when they have the second dose? So uh, let me start again. Uh, Serena, do you, do, you, do, you, do you want to start first? I don't mind. I don't want to be the person who starts first, but I think I think the key thing um, we need to remember is that immunization policy is developed by every country, um, taking into account their their population and and the situation in their population. So we all know that the UK has suffered immensely from COVID, we've had huge numbers of deaths and the policymakers would have taken that into account when deciding how best to roll this vaccine out. Um, the, the thing about the second dose was the case of, as I say to people, just imagine you had two vaccines in your hand and you walked into the house to, to immunize your parents. Your mum is there and your dad is there and you need to immunize them, but you've only got the two vaccines. Would you give both of them to one of your parents and, and risk the other parent or would you give each of them a vaccine, knowing that they will each have a level of protection. Um, and that level of protection, the evidence behind that is developing all the time. So we know that the, the, um, the immunity that you have from having one vaccine is pretty good. So, so that's essentially, you know, the, the decision about the, the first vaccine and the second vaccine. It's a decision that each country is making, taking into account mm -hmm. the situation that they're faced with, with their population. It's about giving as many people some protection rather than giving fewer yeah. people protection. Yeah. Keep that. So Thank you. Um, on a different tack, we have had a question come in, people with concerns about fertility. Can the vaccine impact on fertility? Yes. So once again, I go back to the NHS. I love the NHS. You know, I, I made a living out of it. Right. So the NHS employs more women than it employs men. And having one wife and two daughters, I know that fertility is, is a very important topic, which, which one takes very seriously. So when the vaccine came out, obviously people are going to ask this question. I like this question because this question allows us to answer. So a woman's fertility, if you look at it the biological point of view, it's about the ovary, it's about the, the tubes, the uterus, and if that system is functioning, fertility is functioning. There is some hormonal connection between the brain and the ovary, but that is how the fertility system works. Now, then you look at the vaccine. The vaccine goes nowhere near your ovaries or your tubes or your womb. It doesn't interfere with, with the eggs. Now, the, the vaccine, the, the reason that, I think the reason this issue arises is because we talk about DNA and we talk about RNA. Now, I am new to DNA and RNA. When I was in medical school, we didn't talk too much about DNA and RNA. You know, I am an 80s, I am a 70s, 70s school boy, right? But I did learn this down the road. 
So DNA is the material we transfer uh, in our genes. The, the vaccine has got a little bit of RNA in it, but RNA never enters the cell. In the cell, there's something called nucleus, and the DNA lives in the nucleus. So what we give you doesn't enter the cell, doesn't enter the nucleus, doesn't touch your DNA, therefore doesn't affect your genetic material, and therefore has got zero impact on fertility. Now, this is the scientific answer, but the real social answer is the evidence in front of me. Every single female doctor, nurse, therapist, person I have worked with in my life, all of them have queued up and have had the vaccine because they have worked out themselves that there is zero impact on fertility by taking uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, that's correct. I mean, I think I watched an interesting video recently um, where a specialist was explaining. So, so basically what, what she said was the mRNA is just the code to the body telling it what to look for in terms of the virus. So when, when that mRNA vaccine is given, mRNA link vaccine is given to you, all it is, is it's the code for the vaccine, the proteins, the spike on the outside of the virus. So we've all seen the picture of the virus. It's got all these little spikes of it. And the whole point of the mRNA is to, to, to teach your body to react to that protein when it sees it. As soon as it's taught your body what to do, that mRNA vaccine is, is dissipated. It's no longer in your body. It's not going to do anything else. It is only about introducing your body to those spikes in the virus. And that's all that it does. It does not interfere with your DNA, as Vasa has explained. It is focused only on the proteins of the virus, telling your body, look, when you see that spike, this is what you do. Is training your body to deal with the virus when it sees it. That's all that it is. Thank you, Sadina and Vasa. That's really helpful. Um, we've got some theme with some other questions. Is people are saying, I I've got antibodies to the virus. Do I still need to get the vaccine? Um, and uh, and and if they test positive, so they have a, a positive to coronavirus. Can they still get the vaccine and should they still get the vaccine? Do they still need it? Yes, you see, if you develop antibodies from your first infection with COVID-19, that antibody level diminishes with time. So you can't say just because I was infected with COVID-19, I am safe rest of my life or even rest of this year. So the immunization comes in to protect you, to give you that extra boost you need to make the antibody level go up to protect you from COVID-19. And I go back to my friends and colleagues who sadly suffered COVID-19 in April and May, who recovered from it. Some of them even had long COVID, but even those guys with long COVID are going back to get the vaccine because you know what? Once is enough for them. They don't want to tempt fate to say, I want to get COVID-19 again. So, so, so it's the lived experience of my colleagues which gives me the confidence as well to say, Yes, the science tells you the infection is not enough for antibody levels. Get the booster to put it up to a level so that it protects you from a new infection. Yeah, and, and in response to if you've had COVID-19 um, COVID infection, and um, when you come into the clinic, you will be asked the questions about that. And as long as your first COVID post, uh, positive test was 28 days, more than 28 days ago, you can have the vaccine. Not because the vaccine does anything with, with your symptoms or with COVID-19, it's just really to make sure that if you did have any symptoms after the vaccine, that is very clear, you know, what it's related to, whether it's the vaccine or it's from the infection. And that's really the only reason, nothing to do with it not being effective or anything like that. Thanks, Sadina. That's really helpful. Both. Thank you, Sadina and Vasa. And I can see we've got one hand up, so we've got about 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll start to open up the phone lines if um, people would like to ask a question. So Aisha Raza, um, you've got your hand up. Would you like to take yourself off mute and you can ask a question directly? Are you still there, Aisha? And I'll go to the, um, like I can see Monica's put her hand up. A Aisha might be still struggling to get off um, mute. So Monica, would you like to ask a question? Hi, um, recently I had a staff member test positive for um, COVID-19 and this staff member 
did not show any symptoms, but he had received the vaccine on the 20th of January. And he had done the usual PCR test on a Wednesday, got his results Friday morning. And that's when he got, he was made aware of the, re, of the positive results. So immediately he had to leave the service. And uh, he, because he was non-symptomatic, we did some uh, more tests on him. We did an LFD test on him, which came back negative. And then all the people in the home at the time did an LFD, which came back negative. But then I wasn't convinced because I believe the lab testing is more analytical. So I did a postal test of the PCR, which came back Sunday evening that it was positive still. So he's now in isolation. Uh, the people in the service, um, we are all fine. We've not had any symptoms, no concerns. Um, we've done another LFD this week again. All of them have come back negative and we hope to do PCRs tomorrow, have to give it that incubation um, sort of like period in case we could have picked something from him, having been that he didn't show any symptoms. What would you advise us going forward? Because it looks like the LFD did not pick that up. Hmm. Debbie's on the line. Debbie, love you. <laughs> you want to come on that? Thanks. So we've got Debbie, the infection prevention control specialist. She's just joining us. I can't unmute. Sorry. You, on, you just went off mute. There you are. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, hello. Yeah, um, really, really good question. Now, we know that the PCR test is, is um, really quite sensitive and you can actually test positive for some days, some weeks and some months afterwards. Um, and um, that's why we suggest that you don't retest for, for 90 days after your PCR. It can pick up um, virus that's actually um, non-viable, non-infectious, but just sort of hanging around. The LFD test tests for infectivity, so it's what, how infectious you are if you're infectious at that period of time. And that's why we then check with a LFD and then um, uh, with the PCR. And if the PCR comes back positive, um, then you're definitely positive. But if it comes back negative then you have to assume that you're negative. It's it's really, really confusing, but I don't know whether I've confused the issue even more, but um, essentially what I would say is it's probably an old infection that you're picking up. Um, and my gut feeling is that you won't have any, any further transmission from that because it's non-viable virus. The LFD, the PCR is quite um, sensitive. So trust the, trust the PCR, the PCR, um, um, they've done the 14 days, um, 10 days isolation, they can come back to come back to work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And it puts it my mind good. at rest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's you. Good. But that's why we do the LFDs, because it's just that sort of check in between and it checks the, in, uh, you know, how um, whether people are likely to be infectious. The, they're um, not as sensitive as the PCR, and that's why we do the PCR to check. So if you're infectious and you've got... Um, um, a PCR, then, um, you know, you're definitely infectious in that moment in time. Can I just ask one more question? Um, a staff member has come to me this morning, um, didn't attend work, was supposed to be on shift, and has informed me that her family member has tested positive. So she's going to go into isolation for 10 days. Will, will I need to do the PCR or do I need just to do the LFD for her? No, you don't need to do either. She's um, if if it's a family member that she's living with, um, as yeah. with any other family me member, they go into isolation for ten days. So if somebody's tested positive, um, they go into isolation for ten days, and within that ten days, if they then become symptomatic with those usual things of loss of taste, smell, um, um, persistent cough, high temperature, then they would at that point then take a PCR test, and if that PCR test comes back positive then they have to start another 10 days from the date of that PCR test. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Um, I'll just check, Aisha, did you, were you able to, I haven't seen you be able to unmute yourself, so I'm not sure. 
OK, I, I'll just unmute if you can, Aisha, and I can see if you've unmuted. But Ellie, hello, Ellie. Ellie Southers, hi. Um, Ellie, I can see you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? I have indeed. Um, I heard along the grapevine, and I don't know if this is true or not, that by next Monday, frontline workers, key workers will no longer have priority for the um, COVID-19 vaccination and will go back into the age-related um, priority list. Is that true or no? No, no, it's not quite like that. What happens from next Monday, because at the moment we've had the first four priority cohorts, so that's been the over 80s, the over 70s, care home staff and residents, and then um, health, and, uh, health and social care staff, um, and also the clinically extremely vulnerable. But what happens, so we've had priority for this group, for, the, for those groups, from Monday, they start going into the next priority cohort. Um, so that is the over 65s, I think, isn't it? Looking at Sedina and Vata, I'm pretty sure. Yes. So, so what will happen from next week, Ellie, is you'll, you'll still be eligible. So your staff are still eligible because they're still, because you're, you're from a care home, still priority one. But the problem will be is there'll be more people wanting the appointments. So up until next Monday, we've got, there are loads of appointments in this, in the system, lots of appointments available in the system, um, and they haven't opened them up. But I, I'm quite sure. I think there are lots of 65 pluses who are all very, very keen to get the um, the vaccine. So that's why we're just trying to encourage people to do as much as they can this week. You'll still be able to get it next week, but they're just. I can't. I don't even. You know, I can't promise one way or the other. I'm sure that you'll still be able to get it, but it just may be a longer wait if you need. Selena, the okay. news on the ground is there are there are plenty of slots available at the moment, aren't there, for people? Yeah, there are lots yes. of slots available, and 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 you know, if you've got staff that need to have the vaccine, I would highly recommend that they they uh, um, go through the link and and go into one of our clinics, because as as Vicky says, all that happens next week is the number of us that our priority gets bigger, and obviously the bigger the group, it just may it just may mean that you you know you it might take you longer to get the vaccine that's all that it is but you would still be proud to just be a bigger priority group that's yeah. all yeah, go and on i know you're today. croydon go think this week please yeah and yeah. i know you're croydon way aren't you ellie and Ed croydon have got lots and lots of spaces this week um and also had a call for anyone who's over the other side of the patch i had a call from the head at teddington so teddington has been heavily booked the last few weeks but he said teddington health and social care center i think that's it's at the Ted what used to be called teddington memorial hospital they've got lots of vaccines available starting tomorrow um until saturday so if you're over that way do do book in does that answer your question, Ellie? It does, thank you. And and we did have trouble with the link, as you know, that it was sending us off to not to the COVID vaccination centres, but hopefully that's been um, fixed. Oh, now. good. Yes, I saw Deba had gotten in contact yeah. with you, hadn't she? Okay. Yeah. So I just I just really wanted to say a huge thank you to you and your staff, Vicky, because they've been enormously helpful, and we couldn't have done this without them. So I just wanted to say a very public thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ellie. Well, great leadership on your part too, really supporting your staff to get the, the vaccine. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, Nana, I can see you've got your hand up. Oh, hello. Yes, I just wanted to, uh, to ask a quick question about a link I've seen um, with the description of allergies where the Pfizer vaccine might not be recommended. Um, are you able to clarify at all the difference between the two? and what to consider before choosing whether to go for the Oxford or the Pfizer vaccine. Thank so, you. So, Sedina, yeah. we have a wonderful uh, list of ingredients. Uh, I like my cake story. So we know exactly what is in the Pfizer cake and we know exactly what is in the AstraZeneca cake. And so if you, are, if you had an anaphylactic reaction to the ingredients, then you've got to avoid that cake. Now, do you want us to share you that ingredient list so that you know exactly what we're talking about? We, we can happily share that. And it's all about what are you actually, what did you have an anaphylaxis reaction to? That is the question. If you don't know, and it's an unknown anaphylactic reaction, then we say take the AstraZeneca, the Oxford one. Because yeah. there's something called PEG, which is in yeah. the Pfizer. Over to you. It's very so, so, so what it is, is a lot of the time when people are allergic to medication or vaccines, it's usually because that medication or vaccine contains something that creates the anaphylaxis. And quite often PEG, which is po polyethylene glycol, tends to be the culprit. So that's, that's the reason why 
if you've had an a serious anaphylactic reaction to a medication that contains PEG, um, we wouldn't advise that you have the Pfizer one because Pfizer's got PEG in it. That that that's the only reason, not because the AstraZeneca is any better than the Pfizer or vice versa. It's purely because of the potential allergen in the vaccine if you have a history of having a reaction, severe anaphylactic, so severe allergy that required you to be in hospital. I can assure you that um, having worked in the clinic for the last what, six weeks, we've had thousands of patients who've come through, all of whom have allergies to all manner of things. They've all had the Pfizer vaccine and they're absolutely fine. It, it is, it's just that small group of people who have severe anaphylaxis, which requires hospitalization. Those are the patients that then end up having the AstraZeneca vaccine. But a lot of people will tell me that they're allergic to penicillin or they're allergic to prawns or they're allergic to bee stings or all manner of things that cause allergy. And they, they are offered that Pfizer vaccine. They have the Pfizer vaccine. We've not had a single patient come back and say, I had a, a you know, I had a problem with it. So very important point, Serena. People who carry EpiPens with them come yeah. in and because the EpiPen is for peanuts yeah, or, or something else, they, they are given the Pfizer despite carrying EpiPen with them, despite being allergic to peanuts. There is no peanut in Pfizer, therefore there is no anaphylactic reaction and they, they go happily uh, without, without having any problems. And it's important to differentiate, Selena, between anaphylaxis and yeah. side effects. Yes. So in anaphylaxis, it, it is an, it's a medical emergency. If you had anaphylaxis, you know you had anaphylaxis because you, you had lip swelling, tongue swelling, difficulty in breathing, you might have collapsed. You definitely go to hospital to get an injection of adrenaline. So end of the day, those who have anaphylaxis know what they have had. And, and if they don't know what they had anaphylaxis to, as we said earlier, they get AstraZeneca Oxford. Thank you. That's really helpful, isn't it? And Debbie, I can see you've got your hand up there. Yeah, I just wanted to um, just let you know that we're going to trial something new this week for the infection control team um, and in, in Merton for this week. And then if it's successful, expand it out. We're going to do a clinic um, for care homes that are experiencing outbreaks. And it's sort of it's sort of a workshop clinic where um, people can land and ask questions and just have support from the infection control team, um, share good practice, what's going well, what's not going well, just some helpful tips. Um, and just to support you through um, outbreaks because we know it's um, ongoing and, and you're still suffering and it's still a, a, a difficult time. So if it works well in Merton this week, um, then we'll expand it out next week for other boroughs. That's great. Thank you, Debbie. That sounds really useful and, and helpful to know. Vicky, Vicky, yes. Um, there is an organisation called the Islamic Medical Association and they have produced a lot of good stuff uh, to reassure people because at the end of the day, I'm not from the Islamic faith. So it's very difficult for me to try and convince someone of faith of a faith I don't know much about. So I think I, I strongly recommend people to seek that reassurance from doctors uh, who, who I have read that leaflet. I've got a few colleagues who have come on me on webinars uh, in Merton who, who who have shared that with me. And that's why I learned about that organization. I think it's very important that we respect people because if, if you've got a faith-based reason to ask questions then that has to be met with by people who understand where you're coming from mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's why I'm I, I'm directing you in that direction. Uh, thank you Vasa and I think that's a really good point to raise um, we haven't had that come up but thank you on this, this session and I think just to ask you as you said there is a list of the ingredients but are there things is there you know common things people are asking about is there is there pork is there gelatin is there animal products um, there's some of the things people are asking. Are, they, okay. are any of those in there? There's something called the SPS, which is really uh, Serena's clan, I call that. It's, it's one, one, one of Serena's <laughs> it's, it's more upper street than mine. The SPS has got wonderful documents, and I think Serena will hand them over to you. Yeah, so, so the, the, the manufacturer of any medicine vaccine has to list the ingredients that are in, in the product. So each of those documents does actually have the list of ingredients, which um, I'm sure Nisha will post in the chat for you. So you can see, I think I can see someone's already posted the one for the Pfizer. It, it tells you the, the ingredients in, in the vaccine. OK, so so that that is what will guide, you know, when you're having an allergy discussion. If I said I was allergic to X, Y, Z, then you need to look at what was in X, Y, Z and compare it to the vaccine. And, and are there the same things in it? Because if there's one thing in the vaccine that was in the first thing that I had a severe reaction to, 
then then it doesn't make sense to give me that vaccine because I'm going to react to it. And, and that's the kind of discussion that, that patients need to have with, you know, with, with their GPs if they've had a, se a serious uh, allergic reaction. It, it is definitely worth having that conversation with your doctor. Thank you. And some people may not wish to have uh, sort of pork products in them because of um, religious reasons. Is there, is there any pork products mm -hmm. at all? And some people who are vegans, are there any meat products in them at all? No. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I realise we're just over 12 o'clock. Are there any final people who'd like to ask a, a question on the phone line? I think we've covered the ones in the chat. If you just want to unmute yourself, then we can draw to a close. No. Okay, well, thank you. I want to say a huge thank you. Um, thank you to Deborah. It's been great to have you, um, seen you signing um, there, and hopefully that's been really helpful for people on the call um, who, who, who requested that it would be helpful to have a signer. So thank you. Huge thank you to Vasa and to Sedina, our um, clinician. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really great to have you on board um, and hopefully just giving people information to help make an informed decision. Um, and thank you to Debbie, as always, um, for um, your infection prevention control. And, and thank you also to Nisha. You've done a great job. Thank you very much. So posting um, responses with a bit more kind of different levels of detail in in the chat function. Huge thank you to everyone and thank you too to the managers. I know you've worked incredibly hard trying to support your staff to, to get the vaccine um, and that's on top of the you know kind of on top of the day job isn't it and it, we know it's been a really long hard coming up to a year so thank you very very much for all the work that you're doing all the support that you're giving to these frail vulnerable people that are in your care homes and those of you who are caring for them out in the community settings huge thank you um, for, for all the work that you have done and you're continuing to do um, i'm sure it must feel like a thankless task at, at times and it's been very very tough so thank you to all of you um, please everyone we look forward to seeing you whether it's on all your staff on some of the Q&A sessions. Um, try and get into the vac book, vaccines book this week and um, stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you next week.